Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Vulnerability Research Panel. Uh, we still have uh, Dirkian and Ron with us here. Um, so I'm going to start things off with a very important question. Um, will your birds ever have a vulnerability logo? Um, they don't have a vulnerability logo, but I can imagine them discovering a vulnerability. It was actually, I was playing a computer game a few weeks ago called Valheim, and it turns out there's a hidden shortcut, Control F3, to hide the UI. And I was holding Control, and my bird jumped and landed on the F3 key, and I couldn't figure out where the UI went. I had to, like, Google it. So they're definitely little fuzzers. <laughs> All right. Um, let's go with a more serious question. Um, let's go with uh, Dirkian. Um, how do you choose a target or a system that you're interested in and would like to research? Oh, it's a good question. Usually, I just... So I got a lot of my ideas from actually doing real-world assessments, um, look at a client environment, they'll explain to me, oh, we're using this and this, and I'm like, oh, I didn't know that was possible. Like, how did you configure this? And then my head starts, uh, my the gears start turning, and like, oh, so do you do this and this how it works? So I start researching the protocols involved, right? I set it up myself, and you just <coughs> figure out, like, how it works, and if there's anything that I, I can do that, like, defeats the uh, assumptions that they made. So I, I mostly look for logic bugs. Um, I'm not really into the um, binary exploitation. That's a different, uh, different kind of, uh, of skill set. Um, so yeah, I, I usually look at real world things that have not been researched yet that much, but are used by a lot of people. So uh, that things that are relevant. So that's also why I focus a lot on Microsoft <coughs> vulnerabilities because like, like 90% of the enterprises in the world are using it, so um, it's very big, it, it's relevant, and that's, that's uh, usually how I progress in my things, and I have a very long mental to-do of all the things that I want to look at someday if I have time. Um, so no shortage of research subjects for me yet. And uh, Ron, do you uh, use other meaningful ways of choosing targets except personal vendetta? <laughs> personal vendetta is about half of it. Um, yeah, at Rapid7, we don't have a ton of direction on what we're supposed to research, but our general approach is things that are meaningful to like our customers and to the internet at large. So we're often looking for trends, like what's, what's been popular in the past year. Uh, there was a vulnerability a, a couple months ago in a, in a specific piece of software, and we take a reactive approach sometimes. We, we heard about the vulnerability, we researched it, we, we built a POC and we released details. And I thought, this is an interesting class of software. I don't want to say spe specifically what it is right now. But it was interesting class of software. I wonder if there's other things that, that do the same thing. And it's like, it was network perimeters. So it was something that is pointing to the internet and was semi-popular as a class of software. I thought, I'm going to dig into this and see what other software exists. So I picked out three. I installed them all. And I found one that was like, it, it felt worse than the other ones. So I chose it and found some vulnerabilities that, that are reported now. Uh, usually, if you do this often enough, you get like a spidey sense. If you look at a software and it's like, ah, this is probably going to end up vulnerable. It's, it's not always telltale signs, but I've had it with a lot of products. Like, you look at it five minutes, you decompile a bit of the code, and you're like, ah, oh, this is, this is going to be fun. Or it's like, well, this looks quite all right. Hmm, maybe I can find something, but it's not going to be like golden thing, so I'll put it on the backlog a little bit. <coughs> Uh, we'll take a moment to talk about time framing a little bit later, but uh, you mentioned that uh, you do have a backlog or worklog of stuff that you would like to dive into um, without spoiling anything, but maybe getting, getting hints out about <coughs> what looks to be interesting for people that would like to research some stuff. Do you have stuff in your backlog that you might never get to, but you know will be interesting that you could point people out to look at? So the things that I already know are interesting, they'll go to the top of my list usually. Um, I mean, in general, with Azure AD research um, and with cloud research in general, I felt like the past few years I was one of the only ones doing it. Nowadays, luckily, the more people are looking at it, but it's still like a lot of things are just not looked at that much by the Pentest community, researcher community. Uh, there's still a lot of focus on uh, on-prem AD while like everyone is already migrating to the cloud, already migrated to the cloud, or is working with these hybrid things. And I, I think there's still a lot of things to look at there. Um, no specific topics in general, but like if you look at what is implemented attack-wise, tools-wise, then just go build on that. And I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of things that uh, 
um, that are still with, with vulnerabilities, with holes, with, with flaws, things you could explain better because there's no not much uh, blogs about it yet. So um, I think there's quite a lot left to do in that area. Any extra input? I feel like I take the opposite approach where I don't really have a backlog. I finish a project and then go, oh crap, what do I do next? And I kind of like look at Shodan and look at other sources. I look at what was interesting. We keep a list of the top vulnerabilities of the year. I look back at those and try to get inspiration. But really, I have trouble coming up with the next project every time. All right. Um, you just spoke about uh, Shodan. Do you use some special tools, or are there particular tools that you really enjoy finding a use case for? So you're building on whatever research you're doing, and you have the opportunity to do something, and you're, you're just impressed by this tool that does something really nice. Is, are there some little secrets there? <laughs> I don't really have an answer for that. Um, I, for tools, I tend to be really bad at learning new tools. So I tend to stick with things I learned 10, 15 years ago. So I wind up using like the old versions of WinDebug and GDB with no plugins and stuff like that. And I feel like I use Vim as my editor, and I have a million plugins, a million configs. But when I'm hacky, I'm just using like a monochrome GDB terminal. I really feel like I should learn tools that aren't just the basic crap. <laughs> yeah, I, like I said, I'm not really a binary researcher. Sometimes if I look at Windows internals, I have to look at Alsace. Um, I like the, if it's .NET, at least there are some tools like uh, decompile tools that, that I really appreciate that can decompile things into sort of human readable code. Um, otherwise, uh, if I have to use Gidra, I use X64 DBG. Um, they're quite essential if you really start to looking at the Windows internals part, how LSS handles data, TPM stuff. Um, so <coughs> those tools in general. Uh, the rest I prefer to just use the web things like Burp as a proxy. Um, that's all I do with Burp. I just use it as a glorified proxy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's a very useful tool uh, to have, yeah. Um, I know you develop a lot of tools by yourself. Um, is it for the learning curve, or is it really just you want your own spin on some stuff that exists? Uh, or is it just the technology preference for building them in Python? Um, I always want to understand how things work, and I think the only way to know how things work is to implement them yourself, at least not for everything, but for most things. Um, like, if I take someone else's code, I like if you just pick it, the one time I did that was when I uh, wrote something, I used someone else's code, and uh, well, I didn't look at it too much, and there were some vulnerabilities in there, and I was like, well, from now on, I'll just write my own code, thanks. <laughs> um, but basically, if you um, use other people's codes without knowing the journey that they went through in order to analyze it, then um, I don't think you will get to these branches when you're like, well, okay, so this step, it does this, but what if I change something here um, and do something different? What will that do? And with most of my research, like the whole uh, Windows Hello Flow as well, it's just separ separate steps. Um, of course, Windows does them all at once, um, but if you implement them in a library, then you can uh, do all the steps like in a different order uh, with different parameters, um, some basic fuzzing. Um, so you just, you have, if you put it apart, then you can really analyze it. And uh, if you want to do these things, then you will need your own tools because if you just, like if I have to modify the, the Windows memory in order to inject like a new certificate, that's, that's gonna be really inefficient. So that usually I write my own tools for every research project that I do. Um, and that brings me to like understanding the implementation, <coughs> finding flaws in that. Um, and I also like to, to have tools to make my life easier. Um, like a lot of my research that I do is also with my own tools that I build to automate sign-in with Selenium um, so I don't have to enter the codes all the time, copy-paste the passwords, it just does it all for me. So it's also making my own <laughs> life easier. You know, I have a sim similar process. Um, kind of twofold answer to that one. Uh, sometimes I find it really hard to read academic papers and to like, understand like, big concepts. But if I write them myself or implement them, I can usually get my head around them eventually. So I wrote a tool many years ago for padding Oracle text, for example, and for hash extensions, it's an even better one. I wrote a tool called Hash Extender. And like, I ran into this in a CTF, and I was like, there's no good tools for this, and I don't understand how it works. I wonder if I could figure this out. So like, mixture of reading white papers and trying code, eventually I kind of got the concept, and then I was able to write my own tool that others use now, which I'm kind of proud of. Uh, the other part 
uh, is I, one of my favorite things to work on is network protocols. And typically, besides like Netcat, there's no good tools for like testing protocols because I'm just building it as I go. So I'll figure out the header is 20 bytes. And then if this looks like a length field, so what if I send the wrong length field? Or this looks like a version? What if I send the wrong version? Or this looks like an opcode? If I send every opcode, like 0 through 255? And like, as, I, as I figure out what things mean, I'll just build functions and build tools. And at the end, I have like a library of sorts for this protocol. And then I'll try to clean it up and merge into Metasploit. And then we'll have like protocol support in Metasploit for it. So I find it useful as a reverse engineering thing as well. Speaking of uh, protocol reversing, we have a question from the public here. Um, asking if you have any particular tools or special uh, tricks, I'm guessing, uh, when you're looking at reversing some opaque protocols that you don't know nothing about. Um, I know in your talk you talked about re-implementing a client, which yep. often helps a lot. Uh, and we saw you use GDB, IDA, and yep. uh, Wireshark, I'm guessing. Yep. Uh, anything else in your toolbox? I think that's largely it, and like Ruby, like writing code for it. Um, when possible, my favorite thing to do is to use a packet capture tool, capture a conversation, and try to identify things. When you look at network protocols, similar things usually happen. There's usually a length field near the beginning or at the beginning of each packet, and you want to find a length field. Just because TCP is a stream, you need to be able to chop it up. There's usually a version number of some sort, and usually a version number doesn't change. Or if it does change, it's going to be interesting, because you can use old versions. Um, usually, there's stuff like that. Then usually, there's a list of values. T the most typical thing I see is type length value, where there's a type like string, a length like 10 bytes, and a value like uh, 10 characters. Um, so I'm looking for stuff like that. And almost every protocol ultimately comes down to that. Um, sometimes it's more complex, sometimes it's less complex. But that's usually what I'm looking for. And if I don't have Wireshark available, if it's, uh, I guess I should mention one other thing. There's been several projects I've worked on where I'm looking at a client app. Like, I install this service on Windows, and then I double-click an .exe file, and it gives me a UI for it. Um, if you pack it up to that and listen on localhost, sometimes those still communicate over TCP. The current thing I'm working on that is not public yet, I did that. I, I ran it. I packet captured the, the like, local client, and then I used that same protocol remotely. And what's funny is sometimes the local client, this goes back a couple of projects ago, but sometimes the local, the local client will say, like, I am a local client. Here's a field that says, like, I am authenticated. And the remote users don't set that field. But if you set that field, it actually works. There was a tool called Flex License Manager or something that was used by Citrix. And that was exactly a vulnerability I reported on that, which I'm not sure actually ever got fixed. But it's on the Rapid7 blog, where the local client would say, is local true? And the foreign client would say, is local false? But you can just say, is local true and bypass the auth checks. So like. That kind of thing works sometimes. Yeah, I sometimes have a bit of a chicken and egg problem because, um, like, also in this research, it's a lot about analyzing how Windows joins itself. But that's that's all happening like when you install the operating system. So obviously, at the Windows installation screen, there's no tools yet. There's there's nothing, um, and most of it is web traffic. So it's quite well. You can if you can get it to a proxy, it's quite easy to analyze. Um, but how you tell Windows, like at the, the very first moment you put it up after installation to use the proxy and to think, put everything through that. And then also there's, um, like when you have Azure AD joins managed systems, there's an MDM involved which uses uh, client certificates. So then you need to intercept the registration and then intercept the client certificate and then do that. And then you can decrypt the traffic <coughs> because otherwise things will break. Um, so eventually I figured out that um, instead of having everything, trying to do everything manually and import these certificates during the installation, um, I could just use the device management solution to push my certificate and to push myself as a proxy, and then it will happen automatically. So then you won't catch the very beginning, but at least from the, uh, once the, 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 the Windows contacts the MDM, it will put the right settings, and after that, everything goes through uh, automatically. So um, use the tools that, that you have as well. So you're both professional security vulnerability, re vulnerability researchers. Um, we have some questions about your workflows. Um, I'm guessing some people want to learn or understand how do you manage your time. Are you a very free form person, or do you time box a lot? Uh, do you assign specific time lengths or periods for <coughs> specific parts of your research? Can you elaborate a little on how you organize your, your time? Yeah, for me, I would say I'm on the disorganized side. 
I usually have some idea of the project I'm working on, usually, and the outcomes I'm looking for. Um, the first thing I usually do is look for attack surface and sort of mentally break down all the things I want to look at. Are there network services? Are there TCP UDP services? Are there um, like Windows services? Are there startup files? Are there like configuration files? Are, is there encryption? Is there web? Is there whatever? And try to get like an idea for all the things I want to look at, and like just experience intuition telling me how long it's going to take. Like probably this will take a couple of weeks plus plan a month kind of thing. And then like once I start working on it, I, as long as I'm making like steady progress. I'm not just hung up on something. I feel like I can go for a long time, and eventually I get, again, it's it kind of intuitive of knowing when I've explored the major attack surface I want to look at, or when I feel like I've, I'm not going to find anything. And after a while, it, it, it's hard. Like the current project I'm working on has like eight different protocols to implement, and I worked on one for about two months and got some nice findings and sent them to the vendor. Now I'm like, do I really want to work on the other seven, or do I call this good? Because I feel like I have a lot of context on the project now. I know how to install it. I know how the code kind of is laid out, C++ and the classes it uses and stuff. Like, I want to continue on it, but I also feel like I could do better work elsewhere. So I think once I get back from Montreal, I'm going to have to answer that question, because I'm pretty freeform in that sense. Yeah. So. I'm not a very organized person. Um, that also goes into my research. Sometimes I just look at something uh, for a day, day or two, and then abandon it in order to get back to it later. Um, usually, when I do research a certain topic, then once I have the feeling that I found what I could find, and I have a rough understanding of the things that are at play there, then that's enough. That's usually also the point that I send the reports over to Microsoft. Um, and it always takes a while to fix these things. So um, usually, like that's just a waiting period. Then I have to wait for them to fix it, then see how they fixed it, and then then I can release my tools. And then I figure out, huh, there's a few more things here that I assumed and don't know fully yet. And then when I make my slides, when I make a blog, then <laughs> look at it again, and then find some more things sometimes, or find some alternative ways, or um, research some more parts like. For this talk, also, I had a feeling what was possible, but um, like the NT hash extraction, I actually got it working yesterday, so <laughs> I knew it was possible. Um, I, I had read, seen it in the past, but I uh, didn't remember the exact implementation, and uh, then I got it working, got a screenshot, put it in the slides, and then it was done. But <laughs> it's good to be made a little bit better, so also need to brush up those tools a little bit before I push them to, uh, to GitHub. So it's not always very organized. Um, it doesn't help that there's not, well, obviously you want to report these things and make sure they get fixed so you cannot just write it, push it, and then uh, blog it in, uh, in one week. Um, but yeah, I do have a lot of like concept things that I have locally that I uh, work, that I have working. Um, some things that work, they can do things, but they are so vague that I don't even understand why they work. So that needs some more research as well. Um, but yeah, it's a, uh, it's always challenging to to focus, to find the focus, to deeply focus on a project, and then uh, to finish it, to wrap it up, to write it all down, to make the screenshots, make it understandable for people that haven't dedicated that much time in it. So, um, but well, it works. I've also got a problem that I call like one last thing problem, where I feel like the last thing I do is always half my time. Where like I did a project a few months ago in F5 um, big IP, and I found some vulnerabilities. I reported to the vendor, they confirmed everything, and I went to write the blog. And I was like, you know, I never did run burp between this one endpoint, and I crashed the server and was like, oh crap! Now I got to do a second set of this. And the current project was the same thing. Like I got to the end, I'm like, I got some okay findings, nothing exciting. What if I just do a quick crappy fuzzer and just flip bits in the packet? I know oh, I crashed it. Oh no! And like the last thing is often the biggest thing. And I did that when I was a pen tester, too. I'd be writing the report and be like, hey, wait, what about? And then it just becomes an avalanche. Are you some very individual researchers, or do you uh, exchange a lot when you find something that you're, you aren't sure? You have some stuff on the table, but you, th they would need more <coughs> research. Do you rely on friends and contacts at that point, or do you push by yourself? You, usually, I'm doing things in context of work. and. I have one coworker who's in Ireland. I'm on the west coast of the US. So like we're nine hours apart, so we don't really work together all that much. And I, I like to work with other people at my company, but realistically my team is very uh, very small. So I don't get to do it much. There are like before we have findings and before we have O days, 
I'll occasionally tag friends. I, work, I was working on a weird compression issue a couple weeks ago, and I have a friend who's a big like, crypto and compression nerd. So I reached out to him and said, like, hey, I have a weird problem. Can you, can you help me make a file that compresses to itself or decompresses to itself? And he said, sure, and we built it, and that ended up being like a finding. So like, I'll reach out to friends sometimes, but realistically, I can't do it much just because of I'm doing everything for work. Yeah, so I don't collaborate with other researchers that often. Um, of course, we all learn from each other's works, um, get inspired by each other's research. So um, there will be a lot of people that do the research. I read about it, build forth on it. Um, I do have some projects that I do together, um, like I'm working on a project with, uh, with Olaf uh, right now as well on some, um, some Azure AD research. Um, it comes with new challenges, like um, if I have just my labs on my own machine, it's very easy. If you need to share a lab environment with virtual machines, then get into all new kind of issues, like where are you gonna host it, how are you gonna make sure that we both access it, gonna keep notes, share each other. Um, how do I get the better version of my tool that contains all this non-documented stuff and get it over to that? Um, but yeah, it's, of course it's great to collaborate and get some different perspective. Um, <coughs> usually I do things on my own though. We have some questions from the public that are asking about uh, disclosure, vendors, and funny stories. Any uh, worthwhile anecdotes here? Um, yeah, disclosure is sort of an interesting issue because every researcher in every company has their own policies. Our typical one at Rapid7, a, a guy named Todd Beardsley worked for us until fairly recently. Now he works for government something something, CISA or something. Um, but he helped draft a disclosure policy with my manager and with me that said, like, we, when we send the vendor reports, we say, we, we, here's our typical policy with a bunch of asterisks we'll publish in 60 days unless we agree on something mutually better. And usually we'll, we'll push it out to 90 days or a little bit more if the vendor requests it and they're being, like, communicative. But we've had interesting issues in the past. There was one vendor who we reported vulnerability to, and it turns out they were a customer, which doesn't affect us at all. But we got to be nice to customers. And they asked if they could like, chat with us, the researchers. And we don't typically do that, but we're like, eh, sure, whatever. And they were really interested in like, how we got the software. And I'm like, so, we, so I found these cool vulnerabilities. And like, I have a lot of interesting advice for how to make your software more secure. And he's like, so how'd you download it? And it felt like kind of a waste of time. Um, and they ended up actually fixing things without an extension. So it ended up being OK. Um, I feel like I have other stories that I can't remember right now, but maybe I'll think of them. <laughs> yeah, so I almost exclusively disclose things to Microsoft. Um, I would describe that usually as a bit of a roller coaster. Um, a lot of, every time Oops. they, there's a new way that I think, uh, I think I've had it all by now, but then there's always some new things. Um, I've actually had a case that I assumed it was fixed, then I talked about it at a Microsoft conference, no less, and it turns out it was not fixed. Uh, so I accidentally dropped the zero day on a Microsoft stage. Uh, one for the bucket list. Um, I've also had one that I talked about it last year. I assumed it was fixed. I didn't look at it. I had a talk again a couple of months later, then found a really trivial bypass, and apparently no one else bothered to actually test my things that I say that is actually true and whether it's actually fixed or not. So maybe there's some uh, interesting stuff in there. Um, but then they very quickly fixed that, like within a day, the specific bypass, so I could have my talk in the next day. Um, that was, well, Good collaborative experience. Um, other than that, yeah, I've had one non-Microsoft case where the only way to report the vulnerability was that they, well, they basically required you to do it via HackerOne. Um, their terms were basically like, you don't get anything, but you're not allowed to disclose it. So I was like, so give me some alternative way <laughs> if you want my bug, which they eventually did. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit of a wild west out there uh, somewhere, but um, at least Microsoft has a good, uh, good reporting process and I, I get to talk to them nowadays and get some collaboration on how they fix it, when they fix it, and that usually works out all right. So we have five minutes left, so I'm gonna switch subjects and move on to how do you break into a career in vulnerability research? So what's your first step if you wanna do that? So I have an old friend, uh, Jeff McJunkin, who talks about this a lot. He's a science instructor, among other things. And I always like something he said, is that security, especially research, is like a prestige class. If you ever played D&D, &D, 
you'll know prestige classes are what you can get to after you max out your normal class. And I think it's really true is that like, if you are really good at something, whether it's networking, whether it's Windows, whether it's protocols, development, whatever, once you get good enough, security stuff is a lot more, a lot easier to get into because security is often looking at how things work and how they connect and where that breaks down, where the assumptions made developing it break down. And it's a lot easier to understand the assumptions if you're a programmer and you're trying to find assumptions in someone made in their code, or if you're a, a DevOps and you're looking for assumptions people made in like their deploying pipelines or whatever, you're a lot more qualified to understand it once you've gotten really good at the thing that's kind of based on. So as, as a result, like I think the reason I got where I am is because I was a programmer. I, I did a computer science degree and was a developer for a while and I found security really interesting. And I would develop a lot of tools and release things open source. And it seems like there's a, a, a lack of that in InfoSec sometimes, that people use tools but don't necessarily write tools. And I found like writing tools and then explaining research in a, I don't want to say a basic way, but in a way that's easily approachable is really useful. Like reading white papers is tough for me and for a lot of us. But if someone writes, takes a white paper and writes a blog in a more casual way with examples, Sometimes that can be like a really great way to learn and people really appreciate that. So I feel like writing tools and explaining the tools is kind of how I got where I am. Yeah, I think it mostly takes just a lot of investment, uh, mostly time-wise. Um, I, I, and then maybe natural curiosity is what, what, what helped me. I just want to know how things work. Um, but if you want to get started in security research, um, I mean, the easiest way I think is just to Try to understand the things that you're doing, like Ron already mentioned. Don't just blindly run the tools. Try to read the source code. Try to understand it. Um, try to find some topics that um, don't have a lot of tools, maybe, or that uh, don't have a lot of um, resources, like blogs, that, how to, that explain how the process works. Um, and I mean, if you want to start low key, then just write a blog explaining how a certain process works. Make sure you understand it for yourself. You don't need to find all the kind of zero days the first time in order to write a blog that's useful for others. Like if you start on your journey and you find some things that you run into, uh, it's quite likely others will run into that as well. So <coughs> if you want to start low key, just start understanding it, start sharing that. Um, and then once you understand the topic enough, you'll find parts that no one else went yet that you can research. And then I think um, the vulnerabilities will come by themselves. But at that point, you've probably invested a lot of time in it already. So um, it's just also really challenging <laughs> sometimes um, because a lot of people, especially in consultancy, it's just you do your assessments, um, you have to write the report, and then the next week is the next time. So it's mostly um, if you want to really learn how the things work beyond that, um, either your employer has to give you space or you have to do it in your free time. Um, if you want to do other things in your free time, I completely understand that as well. But um, like then I don't think you will get into the uh, research level um, if you don't have any time to invest into it. It's, it's just an investment and uh, not everyone has that, not everyone prioritizes that, but that's fine as well. But um, yeah, it's, it's different ways of, of doing things, I think, and getting there. I think we're pretty much done. So thank you very much for spending some time with us. I hope everybody liked that. Thank you. Have a great lunch. You're welcome.